You know, today we are going to talk about prayer and fasting. And I know when a pastor mentions we're going to talk about prayer and we're going to talk about fasting, a lot of people just shut off. Because prayer and fasting is something that we hear a lot about, but the truth is a lot of us don't know how to do it. So it's kind of a foreign thing for us. It's kind of an alien thing, even though it shouldn't be. It's a very, it's a much simpler than what we think it is, and it's much more powerful than what we believe it is. Prayer and fasting is foundational in a Christian's life. In other words, you can't be a successful Christian without prayer and fasting on occasion. Let me say it this way. Prayer and fasting for us should be like oxygen for a living body. Without oxygen, our body isn't going to function. Without oxygen, uh, we're going to expire. Without, fun without oxygen, we're going to end up getting stiff. Without oxygen, we're going to end up decaying. Come on. And the truth is, without prayer, a Christian will do the same. We came into the kingdom of God through prayer. We said, Lord Jesus, we believe that you died for us. We prayed, Lord, forgive us of our sin. Lord, Lord, Lord I, I make you the Lord of my life today in Jesus' name. And I receive salvation. We get baptized in the Holy Ghost. We say, Father, I, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We pray and God's hand moves in salvation, in power, and in every area of our life. Romans chapter 12, verse 12. Let's start there this morning. You guys ready? Let me connect with you a little bit better. I grew up in the church. I grew up, I remember when at four and five years old, I remember going to a little Pearl Methodist Church in Omaha on 30th and Fort Street. I, re I remember attending that when I was a little kid. I remember going to First Christian Church in Florence, which was in just North Omaha. And then I remember going to a little country church out near Virginia called Broadhorn. So I, I was raised in a church and, and I loved God, you know, the best that I knew, but I didn't know how to communicate to him. Nobody ever taught me how to pray. Now, we, we knew our Father who art in heaven, but nobody taught me how to pray. I, I, I mean, the extent of my prayers were this. Tell me if you can relate to this. God is good. God is great. Thank you for the food that's on our plate. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's eat. And then, and then, and then morbidly at night, we would pray. Are you ready for this? Down I lay me, now I lay me down to sleep. Uh, the Lord, my soul, I pray you'd keep. If I die, be I'm five years old. If I die before I wake, I pray your Lord, my I pray the Lord, my soul would take. My goodness, that's a prayer of fear, isn't it? If I die, please have the grace to take me. That was the extent of my prayer life. Most Christians' prayer life is is, is one of two things. It is repetitive like before I eat and before I go to bed. Or it is continually repentive. In other words, the only time we pray is for forgiveness and cleansing. And if we're only praying when we need forgiveness and cleansing, then we are probably carnal Christians and we haven't matured. And one of the reasons we haven't matured is because we've never been taught to pray and we don't practice it. Prayer is vital to be in a successful, prosperous, overcoming, conquer uh, Christian in Jesus Christ. It is an absolute, just like a fish cannot survive out of water. Just like we can't survive without oxygen, your spiritual man cannot survive without prayer. And I, I wish somebody would have taught me when I was young how to pray. I wish somebody would have told me what, it, what, what is prayer? What does it just simply mean? Prayer is foundational and it is Simple. I'm going to read this to you. Prayer for a victorious Christian is like oxygen for a living body. Well, first thing, when, when should I pray? If you're taking notes, that'd be number one. When should I pray? When should you pray? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 says, Rejoice always, pray continually, 
and give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Prayer should be our first response, not our last resort. I remember one time we were at a church and, and there was a financial need and it's a little church out in the country and somebody said, well, we should call a prayer meeting and somebody says, come down to that. Prayer should not be the last thing we do. Prayer should be the first thing we do. And if prayer is the last thing that we do, it's because we believe it is the last hope when it is the first hope and the only hope of releasing the power of God in our lives. God has given us breath. God has given us a speaking spirit. In Genesis, the word of God says that we were created in God's image. Adam and Eve, he created in his image. And in the Hebrew, that means a speaking spirit. And when we pray, we're releasing a breath, a movement of air. It's not a thought. We're releasing a breath of air, a movement of air that transcends this worldly place into the spirituals, into the heavens. And God, in turn, releases power to cause the things that we pray to come to pass. Can I get an amen in the house? First Thessalonians chapter five says, rejoice always and what? Pray when? Pray when? Continually. Without ceasing, it says in one translation. So, so that, that, that doesn't mean you're thinking about God. When I, when I first went into ministry, when I first yielded, I mean, I really, 29 years old, I'm getting ready to do this. I remember I would tell people, I've been praying about you. And you know what? I was lying because I wasn't praying about them. I was thinking about them. There's a difference. I could have a good thought about somebody, but when I release a breath, when I release a request, when I make a petition, when I have an ask, the Bible says you have not because you ask not and you don't have because you, when you do ask, you ask with the wrong motives. So I get in God's face, I find out what he wants me to ask and I need to ask it so he could release what he wants to put into my life. Prayer is a partnership with God. Prayer is a partnership with God. You are a Christian, and if you're not, you will be by the end of this service. You are a Christian. That means Christ is living in you. Christian just means to be Christ-like. You can't be Christ-like without Christ within you. So it's Christ working in you. Jesus said it this way, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He said, it's not me doing the work, it's the Father in me doing the work. And a Christian has Christ in us doing a work. But we have to do something in cooperation, in partnership. So when God says, lay your hands on somebody and pray, we don't think about it. We put our hands on that person's shoulder and we begin to breathe out. We begin to let the spirit of faith release through a prayer to cause God to release power, to cause that healing to manifest. Are you with me this morning? Prayer is not a thought. You can commune with God. In other words, you can, you can, you can ask for wisdom and, and you could be listening and, and it could come about in, in the thought. But most, of, most prayer is a spiritual word taught by the spirit and we release it through a natural mouth. Just what I'm trying to get to the point to guys, you have to release it. You, you have to impart it. You, you have to let it go. It has to be a movement of air for it to be a, a declaration. Prayer, I'm going to say it one more time, prayer is not a thought, but you can think prayerfully. Are you hearing me? Prayer is an ask. Prayer is a petition. Prayer is a request. Prayer should be our first response, not our last. Prayer isn't the last result because it is the best thing that we can do. Because when you release prayer, God releases power. When you release prayer, God releases wisdom. When you release prayer, God releases faith. Are you hearing me? When you release what God has put inside of your spirit, when it agrees with the word, God responds accordingly. And he releases power, faith, wisdom, things that we do not know are imparted or given to us. Prayer is often the most 
misunderstood part of following Jesus. And it really is the simplest. Because you cannot be, please hear me, you can love Jesus. You can make your declaration that you're going to follow him. But if you are not a person of prayer, you are not a follower of Jesus. Or you can't be a follower of Jesus very well. How can you follow somebody you don't know? And how are you going to know him if you're not spending time with him? Prayer is talking to God. Prayer is listening to God. However, most of the church, th we think that prayer is just asking God for what we want and what we need. Could you imagine if, if your son, your daughter, your, your employee, all they did was come to you when they needed something? Could you imagine how that would make you feel? God has feelings. Pr prayer is not just releasing prayer. It's not just asking. It is also listening. And if you're going to follow Jesus, then you need to hear his voice. In John 10, Jesus said, My sheep know my voice, and they do not follow the voice of a stranger. They follow my voice. How will you recognize the voice of Jesus if you don't spend time with him in prayer? So maybe we could get rid of the word prayer and say, let's just talk to Jesus. But let's not talk to him like you talk to your friends because you never shut your mouth and you never listen with these. So you got two flappers here and you got one hole here. And so you should use that accordingly and in proportion to that. I should listen twice as much as I should speak. The Bible says I should be slow to speak and quick to listen. And you know who we fail to listen to the most? God. And when we think we hear from God, we're really hearing from ourselves. That's why we've been spending so much time about knowing the voice of God because my job isn't to perfect you. My job is to equip you and to coach you so you can get close to him. So together we can make a difference in this city and in this state. Can I get an amen? People believe they should pray, but they really don't understand how. Prayer is simply talking and listening to God. Not just when I want something or need something. So when should I pray? All the time. All the time. But there is something about setting apart. Guys, I can have a conversation with God all day long, okay? I've done that for years and years and years. But there is something so special about setting apart a time and a place that all I do is talk to God. When I put that discipline into my life, you see, I, I begin to hear from God on a regular basis. God begins to respond to me on a regular basis. And what happens is when I do that over time, it becomes a habit. And that habit will change the way that I live. And that will change my destination or the trajectory of my life. So what, what do I need to do? I, I, think, I think it's very important for all of us to set apart a time and a place that all we do is talk to God and we listen to God. So how should I pray? There's, there's protocol to prayer. You know, if you were going to go visit the President of the United States, or if you're going to go visit the King of England now, the King of England now, you know, before you go in, they're going to give you a sheet. This is what you do. You, you walk in this way, you go to the left of his desk, you stand there, and you wait till he acknowledges you, and then this is what you speak. Don't speak unless you're spoken to. There's protocol into coming into the, the presence of somebody with great responsibility, and there is protocol coming into the presence of God. And I think we, we, we sometimes we're too flippant with God. Yes, he is closer than a brother. Yes, he loves us. Yes, he's got mercy and grace. And yes, we can approach him in a time of need. And yes, there's a boldness when we approach his throne, but, but there should be deference. There should be honor. There should be respect. How does he want to be approached? The Bible says in Psalms 100 verse 4, <laughs> enter God's gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever and his faithfulness continues throughout all generations. How do, what's the protocol? We enter into the presence of God with what? 
Come on. With what? Are, are, you, guys, are you guys here to go home? Thank you. It, we enter his presence with what? Thanksgiving. And we enter, he come closer with praise. And then I don't know if you know it, when you come into his presence and you worship, then you begin to maybe make petitions. God wants to thank you, Lord, for what you've done in my life. Thank you, Lord, for how you've carried me through. Thank you, Lord, how you've taken care of my family. Lord, you, you are wonderful. You are great. You, you are worthy to be praised. There is none like you. I just worship you, Father. There is none like you. You're the first, the last. You always will be. You are the king of my heart. I worship you. I adore you. It is wonderful to be in your presence. And Father, I've got this thing going on in my life. But here's what we tend to do. Hey, dude, I got a problem. King of kings. The Lord of lords. The creator of the universe. And we're approaching him like, hey, dude. Now, I understand that God loves you and you're close. He's within you, but there's protocol. So, so, so you wonder why sometimes we come into his presence or we think we do and we're asking him for things, but it doesn't seem like there's a connection. It doesn't seem like there's a response. And, and here, here's something that I think that we should, we should have for a rule of thumb. Don't ask God for anything new until you've thanked him for what he's already done. Don't ask God for something new until you've already thanked him, if you thanked him for what he's already done. King David was coming to slay Goliath or get killed by Goliath. He didn't know. And he, he was, the king said he didn't think he could do it. The king tried to dress him up in his own suit of armor and it didn't fit. And David said, well, what I do know is I know a sling and I know some stones. So he went and got five stones and here's what he said. Uh, when the king said, you can't do it, David said this, he thanked God for what he already did. My God delivered me from the hand of a bear. When he came and attacked the sheep with my bare hands, I tore him apart and killed him. He said, and then later, my God delivered me from the hand of a lion, from the paw of a lion, because when he came to attack the sheep, I did the same. And God, will, he thanked him, and then he said, God will deliver me from this wicked Philistine as well. He, he stirred himself up and he thanked God because that's the fertilizer for your prayers to grow and your prayers to prosper. So what should I pray? Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, ready? Don't be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, now you present your request to God. And you know what's going to happen when you do it that way? Instead of worrying and then going to God, you go to God with your worry. You cast your care upon him. And it says, and then God, the peace of God, which transcends your understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Well, why, why can't I sleep at night? Because I'm not going to prayer first. Or when I go to prayer, I go to him in a manner that is disrespectful. Remember, everything that is, he created. Remember, he's big and you're small. Remember, he's powerful and you're weak. Now, you may be strong, but compared to God, you're weak. He's wise and we're dumb. Come on. Just remember that. So you're coming into the presence of greatness. And if there's one thing that I, I wish you could remember from this message today, or you guys that have joined us online, is this. He's powerful. He's big. He deserves honor and respect. And when I come into his presence, when I remember that, it, it creates an atmosphere where my prayers begin to take root and my prayers will begin to grow. Prayer is the lifeblood of our faith. Well, the word of God says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But I, I want you to understand something. You, you can't go in the word of God and find faith to have a job at a specific place. 
You can't go into the Word of God and have faith to marry a specific person. You can't go into the Word of God and have faith for a specific business venture. So, so where am I going to get that faith? Faith begins where the will of God is known, and the will of God is revealed to me in... Starts with a P and ends with air. Come on, help me. Prayer. So I have to pray if I'm going to have life in my prayer. Prayer overcomes anxiety and fear. Prayer connects us to God. Prayer reveals God's purpose in our lives. Prayer empowers us to live supernaturally. Prayer is the access point where heaven touches earth and we maintain our lifeline with our creator, our savior, and our redeemer. Prayer is vital. Prayer is like a... Have, have, you, have, you ever, have you ever seen a spacewalk on a movie or, or maybe somebody at the space station? Um, have, you ever, have you ever seen somebody walk out there and, and they don't just go out the door of space and work on the outside or do... They, they have something that attaches them to the rocket or to the spaceship or to the capsule. And they tether themselves to that thing. Why? Because without being tethered, what happens if they get too far from the capsule? They're gone forever. They're adrift forever. forever. Prayer tethers us to God. The emphasis on tethering to God is that you're connected to Him. Together we don't get too far from Him. Just like in baseball, if somebody's on first base or second base and they want to go to the next one, a second or a third, they'll kind of take a little leap out. They'll go a little, bit, a little distance from first to second base, but they're not going to get too far because they're watching the catcher, they're watching the pitcher, they're watching the first baseman, and they're kind of seeing how far away can I get, am I going to be able to, but they, when they see the, the pitcher move funny, come back and they'll touch first base. When they, when they see that the first baseman is getting in position to receive, they come back and they touch first base. That's, that's what prayer does. When you pray continually, you, you're touching first base. You're touching base with God. You're not getting too far from Him. Because Christians, we drift. Anybody ever notice that? Our faith leaks, our vision leaks, and we drift. But prayer empowers our faith. Prayer gives us more vision. Come on. And prayer keeps us from drifting. The emphasis on prayer is not on perpetual repetition, but on the importance of consistency. I, I, I think we should pray first. I really, I really do. Give God the best of your day, the first of your day. You know, pray first before you do anything. Pray. Before you get out of bed, pray. Go to your secret place. Go to your closet and pray. Process the plan of God for today so that God can be working in your day instead of you going into your day waiting for God to rescue you. Why don't you go ahead and process the day in prayer first so that your day is prepared by God so it's ready for you when you get there instead of waiting for God to rescue you when you slip and when you fall. Can I get an amen? The emphasis is not on perpetual repetition, but the emphasis on successful prayer is on the importance of consistency. I'm not just talking daily. I'm talking throughout the day. But how can we do that? Just like you do. I've, I've got a time first thing in the morning. I'll, I'll read five to 20 chapters a day in the, in the word of God. And then I, and then I pray. As a matter of fact, I'm going to move my prayer location so it's even more private because I need to say some things a little bit louder sometimes than maybe Nietzsche is ready for at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. But prayer, I think, should be the first part of our day. Prayer should be when you wake up. Prayer should be before you go to sleep. We should pray before we leave our home. We should pray before we merge onto the interstate. We should pray uh, before we go into a meeting with a friend. We should pray before we go into a coffee with somebody. We should pray while we're helping our kids with homework. We should pray when we're waiting in the doctor's office. We should pray when we're grocery shopping. Praying consistently is like checking the anchor of our life. Remember we drift? 
because there are winds in this creation. There are winds in this falling world. There are winds of doctrine that will push our thoughts far away from God. But what a prayer does is like dropping the anchor. And then every now and then when you pray, you just tighten it up a little bit to make sure it's down there. Just make sure it's down there. Prayer is like tightening your anchor so you don't drift. Prayer is like tethering, like to a space capsule. Prayer is being connected to God on a regular, intentional, regular basis. Prayer, please hear me, prayer produces the fruit in your life that God planted in you when you were born again. When you were born again, the Bible says you were recreated in Christ Jesus to do good works that he prepared in advance for, do, for you to do. He put something in you when you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. He changed your spirit, forgave your sins, filled you with his spirit. You've got all these seeds of potential within you. And part of that potential is the fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is this, Galatians 5.22. It's spirit of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If you don't have self-control, you don't have gentleness working or growing in your life. If you don't have forbearance and kindness working and growing in your life, I'll just tell you the secret here, guys. It's not that you're not in the Bible. It's that you don't pray. Now, okay, so everybody can take a breath. I just want you, to, everybody turn around and look at each other. I want you to be very honest. If you don't feel, because if you don't feel like you pray enough, because of what I'm, what I'm talking about here, then I want you to raise your hand, and mine's the first one going up. Come on, now look around, everybody. Now I want, you, I want you to see that. So Look, 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 come on, look. So that you don't feel like you're the only schlup in the room. <laughs> we all lack in this area. And, and, and the truth is, I remember I had a pastor tell me one time, if you're struggling in an area in your life, go to the Word of God and study that area. I study it over and over and over again. And I'm telling you, anytime you're weak, you're, you're finding that you're not walking in the fruit of the Spirit, you need to pray, pray, pray. When you're anxious, pray, pray, pray. When you begin to worry, pray, pray, pray. When you feel lonely, pray, pray, pray. When it starts to get dark, pray, pray, pray. When you don't know what to do, pray, pray, pray. We need to pray. We need to commune with our Heavenly Father. We need to talk to him and we need to listen to him. See, the discipline of prayer will produce the fruit of the spirit within you. So we understand now prayer is communing. When should we pray? All the time. How should we pray? With prayer, with, with praise and with thanksgiving. What should we pray? We should, we should pray for, yes, the things that we need, but we need to thank God for the things he's already done before we ask him for anything new. But prayer is a little bit more than that. Prayer is also a battle. Prayer is connecting with God, and prayer is confronting the enemy. Now, I remember when I first started learning how to pray, I felt like I had two personalities. Like I'm praying to God and I'm loving on him and I'm thanking him and I'm asking him for things. And then I'm turning around, I'm rebuking the devil. And I'm like, well, no, the devil's not sitting next to God. This is weird. But prayer is a spiritual thing. And when you are being attacked spiritually, you need to resist the devil through the spiritual tool that God has given us. One, the word and two, in prayer. I release the word of God in prayer. Second Corinthians, I don't want to go there yet. I want to go here. Prayer is talking with God and it is also challenging the enemy. You cannot defeat a spiritual enemy with a natural tool. But you can defeat a spiritual enemy with the spiritual tools that God has given us. James chapter 4 says, come on guys, you submit yourselves then to God. Then you resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and God will come near to you. I want, I want you to see this. He says, you draw near to God through prayer. Then you resist the devil. What do you do first? You pray. 
Here's what we do. We, we come directly against the devil. We say, in the, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, you get out of here. In the name of Jesus, you flee. And we're losing the power because the power comes through prayer in connecting with God. Once your tank is full, then you resist the devil. When you submit yourselves then to God, you resist the devil, and the devil will flee from you. See, when you come near to God, God will come near to you. He'll fill your tank, and you'll have what you need to resist the devil. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. How do I resist him? Well, the weapons that you fight with are not weapons of this world. On the contrary, the weapons that you fight with, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. For we demolish arguments and every petition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take every thought captive and we make it obedient to God. The weapons that we fight with are spiritual. Prayer is a spiritual weapon. Now, what is prayer? Talking to God. Come on. Listening to God. Resisting the enemy. And I can take a hold of, when I come near to God, he fills my tank, he gives me what I need to pray. I release that with the authority that he's given me on the earth, and the devil stops in his footsteps. He cannot go farther because of the blood of Jesus and the power and the authority that's in the name of Jesus that has been given to you and has been given to me. But I don't want to do that unless I fill my tank first. So... Prayer is also confronting the enemy. Now, we're going to talk about prayer and fasting. Just five minutes here, maybe. Are you ready? How many of you ever fasted? Can I see your hands? Okay, now put your hands down. How many of you have ever fasted for God, not just to lose weight? Okay. I, I tell you, I've done that so many times. I say, I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast so I get spiritually close to God. You know what? I, I, I'm fasting really to lose weight. I'm, I'm always looking at the, the scale. That's not what fasting is about. You might lose weight, but fasting isn't just food. Your body, soul, and spirit. You can fast things like sugar. Yeah, that's food. I'm going to do, here's, here's my fast for the next, next three weeks. I'm going to fast solid food throughout the day. I'm going to have one meal that I chew at night, and I'm going to fast, oh God help me, I'm going to fast streaming, and I'm going to fast social media, unless it has to do with ministry. And I'm going to fast video games. You see that, I wince, because, you know, I comfort myself with food, so do you. I, I, I comfort myself with video games, you know, when I'm bored, when I need a break. I, I veg out with, with streaming videos, you know, uh, YouTube or something like that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to fast for my soul and I'm also going to fast for my body. Because fasting disconnects me from worldly desires. Prayer connects me to God. Are you hearing me? Prayer connects me and draws me closer to God. Fasting disconnects me and pulls me farther away from worldly desires. So when I pras, fast and I pray, guess what happens? I get closer to God and I have more access to authority and power. Jesus in Matthew chapter 17 came upon this scene where his disciples were trying to cast out the devil out of this boy and they couldn't do it. And they asked Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And he said, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. What was he really saying? Guys, here's why you couldn't cast him out, because you are more aware of your earthly desires than you are of your heavenly father. You're more aware of the things on this earth than you are of the power of God. So when you, when you pray, you get connected to God. And when you fast, you disconnect yourself from the things of this world. You actually, sometimes you, you're literally putting to death your flesh, crucifying your flesh. Now, not to, not to die, but to train. To say no to. Don't try fasting without praying because it'll become a trap for you. Pray and then back that up throughout the day as you fast. Jesus was saying when you're more aware of God than you are earthly desires, you will have the power to confront the devil. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will 
flee from you. Yes, that's you, Meredith. Prayer is reaching out after the unseen. Fasting is letting go of all that is seen. Prayer is grabbing a hold of the eternal. Fasting is letting go of the temporal. Prayer strengthens your connection with God. And fasting weakens your body and your soul's connection to worldly desires. Now, fasting can be more than food. God forbid you could fast caffeine. You can fast naps. You can fast sugar or sweets. You can fast, you can fast YouTube. You can fast streaming, social media, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and, 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 and what used to be Twitter X. You, you can fast all of those things. Now imagine, what, imagine how much extra mi mind time you're gonna have. Yeah, I said that, mind time. The reason that we're so connected to the world is because we spend so much time in the world. And we even spend our time of rest in the world. It's gotten to the place that we actually program our thoughts with the world's thoughts. And so it, it's not bad. We do, we do this twice a year. We do this in January and we do this in August where we have 21 days of fasting and prayer. And we're going to teach just a little bit on prayer every day. If you go on the app, there'll be something on there. There'll be things to pray for. And we're also doing this. We're opening up the church every Saturday at 9 a.m. And it's 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. Guys, it's not 10, 15. It's 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. that we come together. We worship a little bit and we pray and then we individually and we pray corporately. And we'll have things up on the platform here that you can grab a hold of to pray as well. We're doing the same thing at 6 a.m. every day for 21 days. Not on Sunday, Monday through Friday at 6 a.m. And if you can come, please just join us. If you can't, set aside some time in your day, the next 21 days, where you can focus on the thoughts of God, the things of God, where you can worship Him and praise Him, and then you could begin to do business with Him in the heavenly commodity of prayer. Why is this important? Because we've got a city to transform. Many of you are in this room and you came because you, you were hurting at one time or another. There are people out there that are hurting. There are people out there that are scared. There are a lot of people that are fearful right now. They have, they have no, their, their faith is in maybe the economy or maybe their job and they're afraid the economy is going to go upside down and the job, jobs are going to go away. Listen, we exist to help hurting people so they can know God and then they can find freedom from the things that have hurt them or the things that they've done to themselves so they can discover what God created them to do. And then as a church, we help them make a difference in the lives of other people. And then we commit to grow together. And the foundation of that is in prayer and fasting. And so in the next 21 days, we're going to be praying for those who are hurting in this world, those who are far from God, so they will come near to God, pray, pray for salvations in the church and outside of the church. And we're going to pray for this launch. And we'll have goals for us to pray over and ask God about. Fasting is an essential spiritual practice that will strengthen your spirit in a powerful way and it'll dull your appetite for the things of this world. And prayer connects you with God and strengthens you. When you lean into prayer and fasting, you're going to supercharge your prayer life with a stronger, more focused connection with God, and it will diminish your attraction to the world. And I want to say then one more thing. This happens to everybody. It happened already with some of my family. We knew it started today. Some of my family got up and they already ate things that they said they weren't going to eat. And here's what Pastor has to say about that. So what? Don't quit. Start again. Start again. 
I'm, I'm, I, I would love to make it 21 days just drinking my, 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 my protein drinks during the day and eating a solid meal at night, but if I mess up, so what? This is not about being perfect, it's about being perfected. It's not about doing it without mistake or error. It's about the heart of doing it. And when I don't do it, when I mess up, just, God, I give it to you. It was between you and me. Come on, help me do it again. It's not about making it 21 days. It's about where your heart is. So you decide in your own heart. I'm gonna, we're going to ask everybody that's part of High Point Church, those that are here and those that aren't here, that you pick one or two things that you're going to fast. I would ask you to pick one thing that has to do with fasting in your soul, one thing that has to do with fasting in your body. So that could be food. Now listen, if you've, if you've got some dietary problems, we, do, we don't want you doing something unless you check with your doctor. But maybe, maybe you want to fast and just eat vegetables for 21 days. Oh God, I could not do that. I could not do that. God did not lead me to do that. I pray you never ask me to do the Daniel fast, God. There is a Jewish fast. A Jewish fast is basically this. You fast from sunup to sundown. That works really good in January, not so good in August. There, there's a fast where you say, okay, it's just going to be sweets. I'm just going to fast sweets. And, and then I realize that I've been playing... Uh, this particular video game way too much online and I'm going to fast that for 21 days. Something that quiets your soul, something that causes sacrifice in your body. Jesus was a man of fasting and prayer. So I hope this morning that you've gotten a little bit better picture of what prayer is and how simple it is and what fasting does and how it supercharges your prayer life. Remember, prayer is just talking to God. It's listening to God. It's resisting the enemy. Fasting is denying yourself in the flesh and, and in the soul so that you diminish the attraction to the world. You starve the things that you want to die in your life and you feed the things that you want to live. It sounds simple, doesn't it? Let's go ahead and pray. Would you bow your head? Heavenly Father, I thank you for the spirit of wisdom and revelation this morning, and I ask that you take this message that did seem complicated, but God, just make it so simple for those of us who heard it. And get this word out to those who need it all around the world. Lord, help us to be better stewards in praying and better stewards in fasting. Cause there to be such tremendous breakthrough this month that people who've had addictions and people who've had ailings, people who've had ongoing weaknesses in their body, even sickness and disease, that it breaks those things during this 21 days, revives people's spirit and that your joy of salvation returns. I pray, Lord, that it heals marriages and families and, and relationships this month. God, help us focus on you with every eye, eye bowed, every head bowed, every eye closed. The first and most important prayer that you can pray is that you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sins and that he makes you a son and a daughter of God by giving you his spirit. Taking that old spirit out of you, that one that's polluted, that one that's weak, the one that's... Mm, always running from God and replacing you with a new spirit and then filling you with his life, his power, and his ability. Jesus doesn't ask us to be perfect. He asks us to try. And the first thing that we do is we say, Lord, I want you to be my savior. And to do that, I'm willing to try and make you my Lord. It's not about being perfect. It's about him perfecting you. And if you're in that place this morning that you need to pray that prayer and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then I want to pray with you. I'm not going to have you come forward. If you're online, I want you to do the same thing that people are going to do here. If that's you, you just slip your hand up and put it back down when I count to three, and we're all going to pray together. If that's you, and you want to pray that prayer to the Lord Jesus Christ, rededicate your life or give your life to him, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, two, three. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Okay, let's pray. We'll just pray this prayer together with those that raised their hand this morning. 
Say, Dear Heavenly Father, I love you and I'm imperfect. I ask you to forgive my sins. I ask you to give me a new spirit. I make Jesus the Lord of my life today. I believe he died for me. I'm going to say it out loud. That you raised him from the dead. And I make Jesus the Lord of my life today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Make me new. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Now you're next. Praise the Lord. Come on. Give, give the Lord a hand clap of praise for those who gave their life to Jesus this morning. Now, if you raise your hand, or if you did online, your next step is to get baptized. There's always a next step. Get baptized in water. We do that the first weekend of every month. And if you raised your hand this morning, fill out a connection card and we'll get in contact with you so we can put you right in there underneath the water and you'll come up a new man in Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Katie, would you come up? Hey, let's give God a hand clap of praise again. This is the best decision that you can make as a Christian, and we love you, and Jesus loves you just as much. And we just want to show that love to you by connecting with you. So if you could, scan that QR code, and you also, oh, you also have a connection card. So we want to connect with you so you can know your next step. You have one step, and that's just to know God more, and we want to help you do that. There's a prayer request at the bottom of your connection card. That's why every single one of you got one as you walked into here. Prayer is our foundation at High Point Church. And we want to pray for each and every one of you. That is our goal with Saturday prayer. So if you would, fill this out 